Okay, I have to get up for that. Oh, you don't have to do that. Uh, I'm Will Holton. Uh, I taught at Northeastern for over 35 years. Uh, not in history and sociology, uh, but history's always been a big hobby for me. And uh, <clears throat> when I made my first trip to England in 1997, uh, I stopped off in Boston, England. I read about it. I knew that's how we got our name. I even <coughs> taught students about that. Uh, and I was so fascinated that I went back every year for about eight years uh, doing research and, and making friends. And it got to the point that I walked in that small town. I knew more people than I did here in Boston if I walked. Uh, you know, coming out of every building would be somebody I had met. And they knew me if I didn't know them. But anyway, I am the founding uh, president uh, of uh, the, the, the partnership of the historic Boston. And our <coughs> present president uh, is John Morrison. And I am John Morrison. And my interest in history has to do with having grown up in a historic house in Waltham and watching so mom and dad. Use that, you know, I think these are supposed to be. You can all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, they, oh, okay. The clouds are taking care of all of Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so having grown up in a historic house in Waltham and seeing mother and dad rehab it and uh, be open for the uh, 1976 200th and all of that stuff is, is you can't get away from it. Uh, and then my wife and I rehabbed a house in the South End when we bought it. So that's, that, that is how I'm close to history, I think. My, my education has not been in history, but when I retired, um, I, I was able to hook up with Partnership of the Historic Boston's based on a trip that my wife and I had taken to England, including to Boston, England in 2012, where we were guided around by Judy Kamek, who had been the previous uh, mayor of the city town of Boston. This is in Lincolnshire. We'll see, we'll see where it is. Um, and we had met her through Boston Left Foot, which were also guides for both of us, where she was also a guide, but also a member, a board member of this organization called Partnership of the Historic Boston. She said I should get involved, and that's the way it worked out. So we have enough people. We Maybe people would be pleased to just give us a name and a little bit about their background before we get started. Maybe. Would start the um, I'm Liz Nelson Weaver, I'm a member of Friends of the Wilson Harbor Walk, which is an old volunteer organization. Um, and the piece that I'm working on is adding interpretive signs, interpretive panels along all 43 miles of the Boston Harbor Walk um, to bring both history alive and to connect people with today's waterfront. Yeah. One of our major interests is, is geography of ancient Boston. And the harbor and the harbor walk is bringing that to life again. So thank you. Um, I'm Jen Walton, and I'm the assistant director of education and public programming at the New Hampshire Historical Society. Okay. So, and you, have you been associated with us at all in the past? No. No, this is my first history. Good. Okay. okay. <laughs> a small pitch. At our table downstairs, there is a a seat for signing in if you would like to receive re emails from us about programs or if you'd like to be invited or come to our meetings so you can form a little bit more about us personally. So I hope that you all have a chance to sign in, so to speak. Sir? Uh, Brian Sheehy, uh, History Department Coordinator at Love Hand Over High. I'm also the president of the Essex Baseball Organization, so we play 19th century baseball. Okay. 19th century baseball for, started in Boston, didn't it? There's a long history, but <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go there. Right? Yeah. Sir? Hi, I'm Scott Thompson. I live in North Hanover, uh, Massachusetts. I'm actually an engineer, and I like to uh, study the revolution in my free time. Okay. And the engineering of Boston and waterworks and things like that are really a fascinating subject. Oh, yeah. So if you would like to come and bring your expertise with you, that would be just excellent. Sir? I'm a Brian Tillman. Okay. Uh, it's my first time at history camp. I'm from Morristown, Massachusetts. Good. Welcome here. My name is Carlo Casanova. Uh, I'm an aircraft mechanic for my job, a career. I'm just a, a 
how can you say a nerd? I'm kind of more about it. History nerd. You're yeah. yeah. a history nerd, yes. We're proud of you. Yeah. I grew up in the North End. I mean, Welcome. We, you're one of us. <laughs> Robert Wilson, my second history camp, I was born. It's like, grew up in Somerville until I was three, and then like moved out of the active Concord area. So it's like, my family was involved in like, and I'm the music sergeant in the Lex Jim Minutemen. Mm -hmm. Like I've been doing, I've been involved with active Minutemen, Subway Minutemen, Lex Jim Minutemen, Subway Ancient Five and Drum Corps, the William Diamond Junior Five and Drum Corps, Four H, Middlesex County Four H Five and Drum Corps. So I'm a colonial snare drummer, and and for me it's like a history. It's like I grew up on like going in. My my grandparents were living in Somerville was on the MBTA from like Davis to Port Square to Pike Harbor like multiple times. So I was like MBTA aficionado since I was like really little, and it's like, and there's like so much history around here, like no one cares to look around, and like, it's hard to see, and heartbreaking to see that. That's here. so true, there's so much history that nobody knows about. Oh, there's so much history, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a docent at Jason Russell. Like being, a, and, being a member of the Lexington Minutemen, yeah. like we actually get to portray the, like, the living history to the public. And and I'm, I'm a civil war reenactor, and I understand exactly what you're talking about. And I know so much about like the MBT and like the history, of, like the subway system. So like, if there's yeah. if there's anything you want me to pipe in about the about the history, just ask. Well, you got to sign up, please. You yeah. should give a presentation yeah. next year. There's your chance. Yeah. I could if I wanted to. That'd be all right. I didn't yeah. Yeah. Um, Arlene Cardoza, I wish I had more to say, but this is my first time and I'm okay. just, uh, I'm enjoying it. Well, one of the things that you'll see in one of our slides is how many people come to more than one of our events in a year. And, you know, 50% of the people come to three or more of our events a year. So I hope that you will be on the, that side. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, my name is Sarah Lee Kerman and I'm the board of the Minuteman National Park. Excellent. And um, I do marketing and fundraising for heritage tourism. Okay. We, we, you'll see downstairs, I'll always say, downstairs we sell a cookbook, uh, and we are a, a formal vendor for uh, the park service. Oh. So if you would like to bring home a complimentary coffee and think about it, <laughs> or if you want to go to Faneuil Hall and see any of ours, or if you want to go to Bunker Hill and see any of ours displayed, you know, that, that could be worked out. <laughs> sure. Oh, uh, John Payne. I'm from uh, Boston's North End, Little Italy, and history's been all around me all my life. Yeah, it sure has. I really enjoyed uh, the Alliance sides when I was a boy. Ten cents to get on. And <laughs> what street? Chop Street. You Great. said Custer Did you say? <laughs> yeah. 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 Recognized it. <laughs> it's a, so yeah. every week, go oh, when I was a kid on my bike, I looked for lost tourists and all. Don't go the wrong way. And they'd say, Do you know how these houses? And I would leave them and they'd give me a dollar. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you were at least nice to them. Yeah. Uh, ma'am? Uh, my name is Liz Meese. Uh, I'm an architect. I work for the federal government now. I'm the regional historic preservation officer, Excellent. overseeing our historic buildings. Um, I'm also a living historian and I organize events um, for you. And, um, and most importantly, I'm a resident of Braintree. Okay. And our, our fellow resident, our early resident, although we're thankful for the distance of John Adams, there's a great story actually when he was at the court of St. James, actually went looking for the source of the name Boston and was unsuccessful. So I think people have been. Did he come to us? <laughs> Did he only come to us? <laughs> but that's a problem in England today. Yeah. And in, um, in England, they don't know Boston. Exactly. We were, we were planning our tour and, and got in touch with the tour agency and said we're going to Boston. She said, that's in Massachusetts, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the same thing with Braintree, which is named for Braintree, yeah. England. It's, it's, yeah. you know, it's a town outside of Boston. But, um, yeah, our, our best friends in, in Boston, Lincolnshire, travel all over England. And people ask them where they're from, and they said Boston. <laughs> and but they have an English accent, so the uh, response is, "You don't sound American." <laughs> <laughs> so true. And I also, I'm a member of your Facebook page, and I follow you. Oh wow! Remember Vice Chancellor Hall? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, through the Native Historical Society, particularly on uh, Henry Wilson, who was the vice president to the uh, second administration of Ulysses S. Grant, who lived in Native for 35 years. Wow, that's great. Toby Webb, uh, history major in college, finally able, once I retire, to get back into history. And this is just part of the learning process. Easy way to do it, Toby. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're, we're through this. We don't have much time. <laughs> Wake up, machine. Um, so, the first three, we're being recorded. Right? So, the first three slides and other slides in here are quite, have a lot of text. Uh, so, the fact that it's being recorded, you'll be able to play this back in a couple of weeks when it's online. Uh, and maybe we'll find some way to, to read over it so that you can understand what the words are, because there's probably a little too many words to try and read anyway. But the first three slides have to do with the history of Boston, uh, the, uh, us, the history of us, and how, we, and how Will basically founded us. So he was over there. And I didn't found Boston, no. Uh, well, I don't know about that. You put Boston on the map. Um, Came over, went over to Boston, England, uh, 1998. Met the Camex, uh, found the, as he said, became well known over there a couple of years, and began to get the idea that it would be useful to have a linkage between Boston, England, and Boston, USA, so that we could better explore our joint histories um, and talk about the people who came from England and from Boston and from Lincolnshire and from the other counties how they contributed to the development of a whole new society and came over as an intact society, which I think is one of the more amazing things is that there were not families, uh, there were not a group of young men who came over to exploit. There was a whole group of families who came over to participate in the development of a new country in a pure religion, really. In their mind, yeah. In their mind, it was a pure religion. So, uh, and then in 1999, Vera Menino was encouraged to sign a uh, certificate indicating that we were a daughter city, or the daughter city, of Boston Lincolnshire, and that really formalized the development of an organization to understand the joint histories and the contribution of uh, the Puritans and the early settlers to the development of the United States, really. Nothing ambitious about that. The historical society became involved in 2000 and began the series that we call Charter Day, although I don't think it had a name in those days. Yeah, which, no, they started out calling it Charter Day. Okay. Because there, there is no 17th century charter of Boston, mm -hmm. but the founders of Charter Day before us thought it sounded better than, than naming day. Yeah, right which is what it really is all about. It's the name was chosen on September 7th. And also it, it allowed us to, to bring in Dorchester and Watertown a little bit too, because they were all named the, well, same, the, same, the same day. Meeting, yeah. Yeah. So it, it allowed us to entree. Um, we took over in 2003 as the Rappaport Foundation, which had been the key player before with us, backed out. Uh, and it became our, our joy and our burden to, to carry this decision forward into production of a series of ways to talk about our joint history. So we began to develop cooperating arrangements with other organizations that we could partner with to do things. And some, and in the first period, we decided the Chartered Day should be a compressed area because after all, we're talking about Chartered Day. So all of the events for the first almost 10 years or more were all done within basically a single week in the, in the week around September 7th. We'll see how compressed that was. We, in, in this period of nine, uh, 2004 to nine, we began to broaden our exposure to become more interested in the development of Massachusetts Bay Colony up for the first 50 years, basically until the charter was revoked. 
we had a period of 50 years of essentially autonomy to, to do what we thought was best and what we wanted to do. Uh, and then the charter got revoked. So this, this in some ways becomes our, our primary uh, scope of interest is the first 50 years of civilization in Boston, or civilization as we know it. We began to do walking tours in 2009, and the first one is the Founders Trail Tour, which begins, Toby can tell you, you can hear water running on Beacon Hill uh, in the old streamlets. From Beacon is a great uh, aquifer, uh, and the way it's laid out, it's alternating layers of, of dense crushed stone and clay and open stone, so water flows through it as though it was a series of of floors almost, and so Toby has a house that's close to one of the water sources where R the Reverend Braxton had his house and his well, um, and he invited the Puritans over uh, from their first uh, foray into thinking Charlestown might be the, uh, the key to, to where to live because there was little water there, brackish. He said, come on over to, the, uh, to this peninsula, there's plenty of water, and so that's really what caused the movement into Boston and the exploitation of the Beacon Hill and the common and everything that we think of as, as old Boston. Then Blackstone got sick of the Puritans after four years and <laughs> you could, you got could the imagine. hell out. <laughs> in, in 2014, in order to change and evolve the way we were doing business, we hired a consultant who has helped us each of these years to expand at our audience uh, and reach out better with public relations. And if anyone happens to be associated with a firm like that, she has now grown to the point where uh, she can no longer take us on as a small client because she's got too many big clients who need her. So as you'll see later on, we're, apt, we're, we're looking for anyone who would like to talk with us about a professional, professional relationship. She was very helpful of very bringing helpful. us into the new century yep. by uh, using the uh, social media. And our audiences went from average age 60, all white, to quite a lot of diversity and average age about 35 or 40. Yep. And uh, it was worth it. During well, the period 2010 through 18, Every year, we, if there was a possibility, we either developed a new walking tour to complement that, that uh, theme for the year, or we developed a booklet to go with that. So you'll see downstairs, there are two booklets which are uh, artifacts from previous years, one of which is an excellent cookbook for sale. Uh, but so that's been part of each, each our, our idea has been to do something that supplements and supports the, the theme of the lectures for that year. We also, also began to develop a reading group uh, for what to begin to populate the spring and the fall with discussion groups, mostly that are held at Massachusetts Historical Society, but also can be helped at, uh, held at another different virt venues, which in which the person who is the presenter has a particular interest in a historical literature or, or original sources, and will extract those, and we send those to people who are, uh, reserve a space that's all free, uh, and uh, and so we have it. Then two weeks after those go out, we have a discussion group led by the presenter. To, to talk about the literature that's been sent around and sometimes to do a house tour or some other associ uh, thing associated with, uh, with that event. And finally, uh, we are now at the point where we can reasonably assume that we will have a total number of person days of more than 1,000 over the course of the year, more like 12 or 14 or 1,500 some years when we're, when we're lucky. So we've grown a lot uh, in terms of the things that we do and how we're organized, and, and what our perspective is, and what our idea is, I think. We've done all that with an active board, but no yeah. pay. With no pay. This is, <laughs> this is the miracle of it. At any rate, so why Boston, England? Yes. Boston, England is right here. This, this harbor is called the Wash, and Boston is, Boston, the two Bostons are very much alike, sort of in their geography, 
except that Boston doesn't have any, Boston, England doesn't have any hills. But, but other than that, it's a major commercial center on a major highway, har a harbor on a river that's always had European connections. It's the only town in England that's a member of the Hanseatic League, which is the trading league uh, around the, in the Baltic states. And so its, its perspective and its worldview has always been much further than most small towns in England because it's, it's inherently a European view as well as an English view. So we understood it from that point of view, and we also understood it from a religious point of view because it was one of the centers where people were trying to purify the religion by removing from it uh, ceremonies and vestments that were not mentioned in the Bible in any way and to get back to what a historical Christianity might have been like. So these are the things that, that draw us to it. And we can also see from this chart, which shows how much of the population not from, was, was in England who came over here in the first three years, what moved was an intact society rather than a group of men or a group of convicts, uh, which would, tip, would have been more typical in Virginia. So what we have coming from Boston and from out England is an intact, intact society that has, a, that has in it as its core interest the founding of a new society in which they could worship as they saw fit in a way that they thought was, in a thought that religion that they thought was purified. This is called the stump. This is the huge uh, uh, church in, in uh, Boston, England. And remarkably enough, it's a parish church. It is not a cathedral. It is, it's generally said to be the largest parish church in England, which means that its parishioners are from around it rather than from a larger area. But it is a massive structure. Uh, and oh, dedicated in 1309. There we go. I was uh, there for the 700th. <laughs> <laughs> By St. Botolph, from which the name Botolph or Boston evolves. Boat helper. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. boat helper, yes. Right. So, uh, so again, the whole issue of our interaction with the ocean and the, and the sea is inherent in the, this church. But in this church, there has been a long history of uh, involvement of Boston Brahmins and others. Uh, and this plaque is in the church commemorating the fundraising that was done in Boston and, New and in New England in, in 1857 to raise money to repair the church, repair the roof, uh, and build the John Cotton uh, Chapel. chapel. Uh, so, and these are all these are all prominent New Englanders and Bostonians. You'll certainly recognize these names, whose names are uh, engraved in the church. In, by way of thank you, there is a huge connection with us, Boston, that's not recognized, but is uh, in its const in the iconography on top of the gate in front of the state house. This is. Beside the state house. Yeah, beside the state house. This is the coat of arms of the town of Boston, of St. Patoff's town. Um, and it shows the, and, the uh, and Pere Bay, Mary and Pere Terab from the sea and from the land is the slogan associated with this coat of arms. And it shows the two mermaids, emblematic of the ocean and the three crowns emblematic of the large land holders in Boston. Um, and you'll see that it's migrated to Boston, Massachusetts for on top of the gate um, at Ashburton in front of the Ashburton Park uh, in the- in She thinks you're making the strange noise in the ceiling. You are. You, you just you're, keep you're hitting the mic. Oh, I'm That's hitting this, all. aren't I? That's all. There you go. <laughs> strange noise in the ceiling. <laughs> Yeah, okay. it sounded like someone was sneezing a little. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so Boston, England, and Boston, Massachusetts are connected, not only geographically, but historically and, and, and ge whatever this word is. <clears throat> In Boston, they refer to having the most uh, pornographic uh, uh, mm -hmm. A coat of arms of any town in the, t in the country yeah. because they got these naked, you know, whatever at the top, uh, mermaids. Mermaid, yes. 
in Boston, England, going back there to that, you will find currently these headstones, for want of a better word, which are spread out along the Puritan path. And each one of these persons is a person from Lincolnshire who emigrated between 1630 and 1634 to Boston and was prominent in Boston throughout its history, three of them being theirs. Um, and, and the uh, Lady Arbella Johnson was, and Isaac Johnson were the two wealthiest of the persons. They actually financed the trip. Uh, and then, unfortunately, both of them passed away within a couple of months of landing. So we don't have their ongoing contributions to what would have been the development of the colony. And I think that we would have been happy to have had them survived and, and, and prospered and have lived another 40 years so we could have seen them. But, uh, but all of these people are basically devoted and devout people who have come, changed their life from a beautiful rural existence in, in England to come to this Howling Wilderness, as they call it, and build a new society. Howling Wilderness. <laughs> in England, <coughs> you will find the Boston Grammar School up here is the plaque. Um, and it is the first free and compulsory education school in all of England. And they brought that with them, that idea that education is not only important, it's essential. And everyone, at least in the colony, should be able to read, if not to write. The writing is a separate, is a separate skill. But everyone should have enough skill to be able to read the Bible and to be able to think about it, because they're going to spend a lot of time in religion. Did you say? Yeah, uh, this uh, school uh, was the model all the way through the curriculum and everything uh, for Boston Latin School when it was founded in 1636 yep. or seven, six, I think. Yeah, year before Harvard. And this is Judy Carmack and her husband, uh, John Carmack who was Will's guide and my guide when we went over in 2012. Um, she is a current member of our trustee. She's a member of the board. Um, and, uh, and again, this is the badge that she wore on ceremonial occasions. It's about you know this big, small, couple of inches on the side. But it is the ceremonial badge worn on the long chain on this ceremonial moment for the uh, mayor of Boston, Lincolnshire. And finally, when the South was putting in a uh, organ in the 1870s, they put it up against a wall. And so the tracery on that wall, which had been an outside wall on a breezeway, had to come down because otherwise the rain would have come through onto the organ. So in order to, and so at that point, um, Trinity Church was being built. And however it happened, this is the tracery that came out of St. Patal's Church. And you can see the place on the wall that where it came from. And it's now at Trinity Church for all to see, cementing the connection that we have with, uh, with the Stomps and with Boston England. It's in the back of our Trinity Church in Copley Square, yeah. uh, facing the garden yep. on uh, Clarendon Street. So those are, the, those are the immediate connections. And then there's the whole history of Every hundred years, something has to happen to recognize our significant contributions. So uh, in 1930, there was a whole week of festivities as many people came from Boston, England, to help us celebrate our 300th anniversary. And now we're looking at 400, which I expect the partnerships that play a role in. So what do we do? <clears throat> As an organization, this is our mission statement, that we, have a, that we have a twofold duty to foster public understanding of the contributions of the 17th century founders of the city of, of the town of Boston and uh, Massachusetts, and particularly their enduring legacies, which shaped the principles of which the United States of America were established. And secondly, but not least, is to preserve the historical linkages with Boston Lincolnshire, for which our Boston was named. Nat Shardley, who was one of our advisors, advised us that past history and public history should be meaningful. And we try to make it. We try to say this is not something that's, that's static, but this is something that has, is part of our very nature today, whether we recognize it or not. 
We try to admit, and market and advance the PhD, the Partnership of Historic Boston, which is us in everything that we do by putting our best foot forward at all times. <clears throat> in educating the public, we try to say something about new about the Puritans every year. There's always there's an ongoing uh, evolution of the uh, uh, description of who the Puritans were. And in point of fact, our wrap-up speaker this year in the fall will talk about the history, history the pre presentation of the Puritans from 1640, when the first polemic was sent back to England, all the way to the present, where we've begun to really understand who they were, how they lived, what their ethic was, and all of that stuff. So it should be a fine uh, uh, bookend to a, what should be a very good Charter Day series this year. We have to inspire. Part of it is to re recognize that this is not dead, but this is living in all of us today because the ideas that were generated in Boston's in those days still go forward. And uh, we try to have an organization that's strong enough to do all of this with very few people who are all volunteers. There's an advisory board, which is very active, and we reach out to at all times to, to say what we're about to do, what we would like to do, what we're thinking about doing, how can they help us, uh, how can they sponsor or, or preserve what we're trying to do, and how can they help us to get to where we're going to even better. As an organization, there's a 12-person board of trustees. Each person has a three-year term, three, three year, three, four terms expire each year, but they're infinitely renewable, and as Will can tell you, they typically get renewed. <laughs> Um, I guess I will. Yes, he will, he will go along with that. Um, there's an unknown number, an undefined number of members. The membership responsibility is to elect the trustees every year at the annual meeting, but uh, the members themselves may be trustees, and there, and there are 16 members at this point, of whom a dozen are currently also trustees. But one of the things that we've tried to do in last year and this year is to, through the body of assistance, to open up a pathway for persons who want to volunteer and, and take a look at getting involved. And then, so that would, they would become a body of assistance, which basically means they get inv invited to all meetings, they're kept involved with what we're doing. If they want to elevate, then they can nominate themselves as a member. And as a member, if they want to further elevate, they can in, uh, nominate themselves as a trustee. So it's worked out. There's a ladder for getting involved at each step without pushing you too far, because there's a lot to do, and we tend to suck people in. And, uh, and it, it can be an unhealthy experience to feel overburdened. So we've tried to make this ladder where each step is a voluntary step, knowing what you might want to get into. <clears throat> it's worth mentioning that we actually have done Charter Day themes every year. These are all of the Charter Day themes from 2001 through 2018. The 2019 doesn't yet have a full formal name, but it is a further look at the organization of the of society in Boston in 1630 to 1650 in all of the elements that we can reasonably take a look at, what the women did, what the town structure was, um, what was the overarching ideas of government and equity. All of those things are sort of built into this year's presentation, but we haven't figured out a name yet for it. A little bit of history. So <clears throat> before we got involved with a public relations person that helped us to look at how to smooth things out in the presentation, we had these elaborate uh, websites through which you understood who the partnership was and with whom you engaged in the partnership and enrolled or, or registered yourself for our events. We've tried to move beyond that, as you'll see. But at any rate, and so just to kind of give you a sense of how condensed and how intense the early days were, you can see in 2005, we, had a, we started off with September 7th on naming day, fortunately happened to be a good day to get started, was a lecture at 10, a walking tour at two, and a panel lecture at, at six. So if you had that day available, you could have come to three, but if you didn't have that availability, you missed all three. Moving on to the eighth, the old state house was open all day and we helped publicize that. 
and there was a lecture tour and a, and a book signing at Commonwealth Museum from 6 to 7.30 in the evening. The Commonwealth Museum, Museum is not all that easy to get to, so events there have done better during the daytime than they have during the evening. On the 9th, there was the meditation of dedication of the Anne Hutchinson statue uh, at the State House. There had been a long history of that. It had been done a lot of years before, and people didn't know how to think about Anne Hutchinson, still really don't. But their statue had been in a basement for a number of years, I think, and then finally brought to the fore as something that Boston was proud of rather than ashamed of. So there was that, and then there was a lecture at the Boston Stock Exchange about what joint stock top companies were, which was how we were set up as a joint stock company in Boston, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. And um, then the 10th, there was also a birthday party for Boston. You'll see, birth you can see the birthday cake. I think it's actually Boston birthday cake to celebrate our <laughs> birthday. <laughs> Uh, and Somehow then, I don't remember that one. Uh, well, <laughs> there are lots of pictures of Boston birthday cake. We had some better looking ones. Yeah, that's right. Um, in any event, yeah, so the 11th we carried on with, uh, at, with the Sunday uh, at the Sabbath. There's always a Sabbath service at First Church on the closest Sunday to the, to the 7th, um, which tends to build in the theme of our year year talk, so it's, it's not only just a sermon, it's a sermon that's pointed to what we're doing in the uh, subject matter of that theme. And then there was, there we had a joint relationship with Ipswich, so there were, uh, there was walking tours in Ipswich, uh, and that was, that filled out, that filled out the year. So within f that concentrated five days, um, we did 10 or 12 different events. The problem was, it turns out, that if you happened to not be available that weekend, you missed all of those, and then nobody could go to all of those things if they were available that then. So that was one of the impetus that spread out Charter Day over almost two months, as you'll see. But at any rate, so these are the other, some of the other fun things we did. This is, uh, we did something at uh, Saugus Ironworks. Far right. At Saugus Ironworks. This is at uh, the farm. This is about... Uh, the, what we learned from the Native Americans is how to plant so that you could go away, basically, and the planting would take care of itself. It's, it's a successive planting where the first are in are the corn as it sprouts, then the beans go in and they twirl around the corn stalk and grow up with the, with the corn, and then two weeks later the pumpkins are uh, planted because they have broad leaves and so they tended to shade out the uh, weeds. So it was, it, was a, it was a planting that basically takes care of itself, and you can come back in the harvest season, and if the bears and the wolves and the dogs haven't eaten it, then you have plenty to eat. <coughs> that year, uh, we focused on the Massachusetts tribe. Yes. Uh, and uh, th these are members of the tribe, the little ones and the chief, or Sockham, uh, planting the seeds for the corn. So you, this, is, this, again, is just to show the comparison of how sp concentrated things were and how spread out they are now. And to say that before, two, I got a typo there, don't I? Before 2014 rather than 2104, which is so long. Um, <laughs> um, if you couldn't attend that weekend, then you missed everything. Now it's everything spread out. You can decide which you want to come to. We publicize these plenty of weeks in advance so people can plan what they're going to do. We have a long email list for Eventbrite, which is how we do the publicity and through uh, constant contact. And again, if you would like to be on that list, I encourage you to register downstairs. That would be fine. But just to show that, the, that we've spread everything out now so that all of the Charter Day events, of which there are oftentimes as many as 20, spread out over almost a two-month period. We have five minutes left. Right. And we also have a, uh, done reading groups. And again, if you happen to have a thesis that you're working on or a paper that you're working on or a particular subject that you're interested in, we would encourage you to get in touch with me or with Will about doing a reading group. We mostly do these at Massachusetts Historical Society. 
and you would send two weeks ahead, we would send out the readings, and then the group gathers at the Historical Society to with you or with whoever is doing the presentation to discuss the material, and, and we have a good time, and then we usually have some biscuits and a little bit to eat afterwards. <laughs> you can see how much this has improved the uh, number of persons who have come with this graph. Each of these little blots is an event, and you can see how the number of events has incre increased and the number of persons at events has increased over the last three years. Um, I haven't done 2018 yet, but it was a good year too. But our, our, at this point, we're, we're basically a nine or 10 month a year organization. These are some of the things, or these are the things that we did for Charter Day this year, and I'm just gonna scr scroll through them quickly so you can see them and then we're almost done. But you can see, we, we do our advertising through Eventbrite, and in the Eventbrite, we will have a little picture and a discussion, and you can log on, and most of them are free. Uh, and so we do, uh, these are, these are the, there are nine, last year there were nine uh, uh, groups before Charter Day, uh, reading groups, and, uh, from and, and events at the Dean Winthrop House um, and one also exploring an old house in Charlestown uh, and then three more and then three more before we actually got into Charter Day. This is, this is one that I did. Um, very interested, overstating the bounds, how the, the Puritans expanded their borders. The largest, in Massachusetts, the largest, the, we were north the northern boundary of Massachusetts in those days was the middle of Lake Winnipesaukee, went all the way over, <laughs> all the way over into Maine, and the southern border was ten miles south of where it is now into uh, Rhode Island. Uh, so we did more. These are the last of the spring events: a Founders Trail tour, another piece on in Dedham on the development of the Dedham Grant. A huge, interesting story there because Dedham at one point spread all the way down to Rhode Island and it spun off I think eight or ten or nine nine towns uh, and then got into Charter Day, uh, did a walking tour, then we had a, a discussion uh, at Old State House, uh, Old South Meeting House on Boston then and Boston now, how we look then, how we look now. Uh, Desiring the Body of Liberties is uh, was this, the story of the first slave ships to bring, uh, take American Indians who had been captured in the war to into slavery, and not a pleasant story, uh, and bringing back the first Negro slaves to Boston. Is this, is this, is this last year's events or this year's? This is, this is last year. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is 2018. Um, and then Lust for Land had to do with the, the roots of King Philip's War and, uh, and how these started how the tribes and the brethren in the tribes uh, held together. And Lisa Brooks's book has won the Bancroft Prize this year that she based her talk around. So she's done really, really well and it was a great talk. And then we did a new walking tour on three generations of Boston, what the what late Boston looked like. And then we did a piece on protecting the charter, how the, how the uh, emissaries from King Charles in the uh, 1660s after he was uh, restored, after the uh, monarchy was restored, how we rebuffed them from taking the charter away from us for almost 20 years, so there's a 20-year period of keeping them at bay to continue to have our own autonomy. And then we did a thing on, uh, you can just get an idea. But anyway, so, so at the, by the end of the time, 30% of the people had been to two or more of these events, or maybe three or more of these, yeah, three or more of the events, 40% of the people have been to three or more of these events. We think that's good. I mean, it says something about the fact that we're doing something good. Again, we're looking for a new consultant. If you know of anybody who has, has looking for a new client, give us a call. Um, consultant on, on uh, publicity. Yeah, on publicity. Um, uh, a short uh, uh, breakout of in, we made a little bit of money last year, as we usually do, on a very small budget because we're all volunteers and nobody gets paid. Uh, when we have a single funding, or we have a large funding agency, and these are things from the reports they did to reduce to them each year to say how important their income 
was to us and how it allows to make these programs free than, uh, rather than having to charge for them. Because if our job is public history, we shouldn't have to pay for stuff that's public. Um, <clears throat> we also sell, as I mentioned, a cookbook that's here. Uh, this is Steve Kenny, who's one of our board members who's selling it. Uh, and in this chart of incomes, the, the second stream here is the money that came in by month by month for the sale of the book. It's important to us. But it's also important that the board is, as any good board ought to be, the major source of income for us. So we have a good, solid, strong, supportive board. Uh, the cookbooks for sale for downstairs at five bucks <coughs> is a picture of one of the recipes that you could build, that you could make if you buy the cookbook. Strawberry cornbread. Yes, <laughs> strawberry cornbread, delicious. Um, so in closing, if you have a room that you would like to have some people fill, we have and intend to continue to have a significant place in the telling and understanding of Boston's early history. Uh, and in, in a reading size or a small room or in a large auditorium, we hope that we can help you to fill it. So give us a call. Thank you for coming to our presentation. <laughs> Other questions? One minute overtime, so we got room we for didn't a few minutes. Where, where was the harbor? Because if you look at Google Maps, yep. it looks like it's nothing but farmland around the, the waterside uh, where it looks like there would There be was no place. harbor in Boston, Lincolnshire. Okay, where did they The start? ships came up the river yep. about five miles from the sea. In home? No, up to up to Witham. Oh, up to Witham. Okay. Witham. Witham. W I T H A.